So the lady asked me if I was married. I said, no, I'm not married. She said that, you know, would you like to marry my niece? I said. A man with no legs <laughs> and he's collecting <laughs> panties from travelers. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> What's going on over here? Uh, it's kind of an embarrassing, embarrassing story to tell. Then he said that, Kamran, you are going too fast. Slow down. Have you guys watched uh, this movie, Kabhi Khushi Kabhi Gham, where the Shah Rukh Khan makes his entry and he's on a helicopter in front of a big mansion. You should be coming to Laya on a helicopter like Shah Rukh Khan. <laughs> and no matter where you sleep, the dreams remain the same. One time I failed a math test. My mother was very angry. So she collected all shoes, tied them together with a rope and made a necklace of shoes and made me wear it. Thank you guys for coming in for this uh, fireside chat. I have Kamran Ali with me over here. How I like to describe him is basically if follow your passion was a person, I think it would be Kamran Ali. Why is that? We'll go through the whole chat. What we are going to do is we are going to go through his complete life, stories from his uh, childhood, how he got into biking for 50,000 kilometers uh, from Turkey to Germany and then all of the Americas. The idea would be to basically get some inspiration from him. There is some fire over here, but we want some fire in your hearts as well. So I want to start with the place that where you're born in. It's mm -hmm. called Laya. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what it means to you? First of all, uh, good evening everyone for coming here and thank you so much uh, for arranging this session. The story starts um, in a small town called Laya in Pakistan, close to Multan, right in the middle of Pakistan. That's where my story starts. And uh, back in the day, we did not have, you know, TVs or we had TVs, but you know, they were not running 24 seven and there were not many toys. And my father ran an old tire shop. And uh, so what do I do as a kid? So, you know, the kids need toys to play. And my toy was a small tire, um, an old motorbike tire that I used to steal from my father's shop. And I would roll it all day long in the dusty streets of Laya, <laughs> barefoot and uh, in hot weather. And sometimes, you know, my feet would have blisters and my mother would say, Kala ho gaya, you have become black, you know. Dhoop mein sara din phirta hai. And uh, so that's where, you know, I got somehow, you know, a sense of adventure that, you know, the bicycle tire was rolling and I was imagining that, you know, it is taking me to places um, and, you know, there would be small speed bumps and then the bicycle, you know, tire, fast bicycle tire would, you know, f be in the air for a while. It gave me some sort of adventure. So that's how, you know, uh, from bicycle, one tire and then, you know, you get cycle, bicycle, yeah. two that's tires. It. And yeah. that's how it developed, basically, that, you know, this is where the, the start came from, yeah. as you can play this. Uh, little video. Um, so this is basically kind of my me. Um, I published this video called Mera Laya on Instagram. Basically that tells my story and the story of the city that I grew up. So basically you're saying that there were lack of toys for you mm -hmm. because your father is a very hardworking man and he's yeah. repairing tires basically. Yeah. Very, very difficult job yeah. to do so. A very dangerous at the same time. So you have a Sohrab cycle over here that weighs 20 to 22 kgs. Mm -hmm. And you have a wheelie on that one. Yeah. How is that possible? I mean, can you still do it? I mean, I can do it now. I cannot do it for a very long time. Back in the day, you know, I was practicing it every day. I used to, you know, borrow bicycle. This is a borrowed bicycle. All the tours that I did in Pakistan, they were on a borrowed bicycle because when I was a kid, you know, I, I used to get, get injured a lot. And one time I had a big gash on my left thigh. So even right now it's visible, it's like four inch uh, gash I got and I could, you know, I could literally see my bone. Right. Um, and uh, so after that, you know, I completely destroyed the bicycle. My father said this was your first and last bicycle. Seems like a strict man, but also a loving man at the same time. Yeah. Uh, I want to touch upon your mother. Uh, one of the stories that you have said is the necklace of shoes. Mm -hmm. What was that about? So there were a lot of expectations from my family when I was growing up and somehow they sensed that 
this kid is you know has you know the capability to study so there was a lot of pressure on me so we are eight siblings um and uh, somehow uh my family believed that this is the only guy who should invest on and this is the guy who is going to deliver so my mother then you know uh you know and i studied i i received a msc degree in pakistan and then i got another msc degree in germany and then a phd degree um and my mother used to say that you have done the study of <laughs> your all siblings together <laughs> <laughs> and which is kind of true um uh, my other siblings did not go to college as a kid i used to get all all the time i used to get positions at school and uh, one time i don't know why one time i failed a math test and uh, my mother was very angry so she collected the shoes all shoes of the houses and uh, you know tied them together with a rope and made a necklace of shoes and made me wear it and in front of all my siblings and relatives and i was crying and the necklace of shoes was heavy and that was basically to teach me a lesson that uh, you know um if you don't study then there is no place uh, for you and uh, that has such a profound impact on me it was embarrassing but it's such a uh, profound impact on me that i after that i never failed a test ever in right in yeah there was one time i failed the driving test but the practical one uh, other than that i never in germany failed. in germany yeah okay is yeah. your brother happy with when you came to germany no. now that now if he thinks about no, it no he, no he is is not happy have you guys watched uh, this movie uh, kabhi khushi kabhi gham yes yeah so there is a particular scene uh, where the sharukh khan you know makes his entry and he's on a helicopter and the helicopter lands in front of a big mansion and then you know he runs with the briefcase and he said that you should be coming to laya on a helicopter like sharukh khan <laughs> and he said that you know you have gone abroad you had the opportunity to earn money you should charter a plane or you you know bmw mercedes germany makes them you right. should come on a bmw or a mercedes not on a bicycle So I want to go now into when you're starting you're done with your PhD mm-hmm. and now you're starting to basically fulfill your dream. Mm-hmm. I found this picture which is a wallet calendar. Mm-hmm. What is this about? So in 2002 I had this dream of cycling from Germany to Pakistan. So the first couple of years went uh, into my master degree in computer science um and then I started PhD and doing multiple jobs. at the university uh trying to pay off all the loans uh trying to pay for you know house expenses back home supporting my family marriages of sister marriages of brother all that and uh while at the same time nurturing also dreams my dream while going through all this pressure of of uh, a phd degree of uh, in which you know i started losing interest in and uh, after i had finished my then the the phd degree and started doing job and at one point i had paid off all the loans and then basically i had no excuse left not to, to start touring and uh, then i said to myself okay i'm going to start my bicycle tour somewhere in 2011 yeah by that time i will have enough money and i will have enough uh you know work experience or you know i i would have spent enough time at the at the company that i would be able to get some holidays and i used to you know i marked a date and i used to keep a calendar and every day i would cross off one day i'm of actually this. surprised this survived for a year yeah. in your wallet though so i used to cross days and you know how many days left how many days left okay and eventually you know in 2011 uh 6 uh 4th june 2011 i started my bicycle so tour so this calendar is playing your trigger right so yeah. it's basically pushing you to yeah. do that every day you know just before going to bed another day off when you are not uh, following your dream which you have been nurturing for a very long time and which you are not able to shake off easily and you know if for 8 10 years if you remember some promise to yourself and uh, it is questioning you every day it means it has some sort of significance or you know it has 
some deeper roots inside right. you. And uh, when you are not able to pursue that dream, that does ask you serious questions. Exist it puts you into in some sort of existential crisis mm -hmm. and questions you whether whatever you are doing has any meaning to it if you are not following your dream. Right. Do you have a uh, planning done? How much planning did you do or how much did you leave it to? We'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. Especially when you are you know, about to start such a busy, big bicycle tour and you have no idea about it. So there's a, that tremendous fear of, uh, of failure. And the only way to overcome this fear of failure is through planning. That right. you start uh, analyzing, okay, what is this fear all about? Is it the security fear? Is it the financial fear? Is it uh, the fear of not having an accommodation? Is the fear of not having water? Is the fear about, you know, the wild animals or injury? What kind of these fears? You know, you kind of try to find the, the, the reasons behind fear. And then you start working on them. Um, if, and then you start eliminating the fear. And once you have a complete plan, then basically there is no fear. The only way to deal with fear is through preparation. And, you know, in, from 2012 to 2011, I had nine years to plan. And when I was, I had planned, you know, I knew the route so well. But you um, said you were swimming five days a week. Yeah, for planning, just, yeah. Just for that. While I was, uh, uh, you know, trying to stay in, uh, in shape, I was yeah, also doing... Uh, some sort of bodybuilding, fitness training, right. uh, swimming, um, and cycling, of course. Um, you have to do it because otherwise, uh, if you leave on tour in a completely unfit way, which I'm going to do, by the way, <laughs> very soon, then the, the first few days are very tough. When you go back to Pakistan, basically, you went to your mother's grave directly. Mm -hmm. uh, would your mom be proud at this point? Did you feel that way? In 2015, when I resumed my bicycle travel, uh, I had quit my job in, in, at Siemens in Nuremberg and uh, went to Pakistan, so I took a longer detour. Uh, I started from exactly where I had left in Turkey, in Sivas, uh, stayed in the same hotel. And uh, after spending about three months, I reached uh, Leia, and nobody in Leia, including my family, including my a uh, brother, nobody knew about my arrival, right. uh, that I would be coming. They knew that, okay, he's on, and, you know, on the road from Islamabad to Laya, but they did not know that on this particular day, he's going to come. And uh, when I reached Laya, I just, you know, went past my house. Uh, I did not stop there. Just went past, looked at the house, looked at the gate where I had last uh, waved my mom and then carried on. My journey stopped uh, in the graveyard at uh, mom's grave. That's the picture right after I had uh, finished my... Right. Uh, it must be an exhilarating feeling though. To, uh, to basically show what it did to you, I want to move to this picture actually. Mm -hmm. This is between before and after picture of your whole trip. A lot has changed. Yeah. Good mustache, though. <laughs> I'm impressed by the mustache. Why are you, why are you, why are you preparing this throughout your uh, journey? So of there is a, there is a uh, there is a tradition that I have been following since 2011. So before the start of every tour, I don't have mustaches, <laughs> and at the end of the tour, I do have mustaches. So this is only a difference of few months, actually. Right. And when I posted this picture, um, a guy commented. A nasty comment, by the way, but uh, funny in a sense. So the guy said, in the left picture, you look cool, you look like Kamran on bike. On the right <laughs> side, you look like Kamran bike chore. <laughs> bike bike thief. thief. Bike thief. Right. Um, and I looked at it, tried to look at it at, in, a, in an objective fashion. I said, yeah, it looked like I wouldn't give the bicycle to this guy on the right. Uh, you were in Uzbekistan. You don't know the language, you don't know the culture, and somebody asked her niece <coughs> to be married with you. It was a proper marriage proposal. Mm -hmm. Is it the first of its kind, or were you being proposed a lot of marriages throughout your travels? I mean, I, I would admit I haven't been proposed a lot, uh, but uh, 
Uh, this is actually uh, Tajikistan. Um, I was cycling in the Pamirs, uh, big high mountains, Hindu Kush mountains. And just across the river, then you have Pakistan, actually. So I saw this family uh, sitting in the shade, and it was a hot day, uh, struggling with the, you know, bicycle, paddling in the, in the high mountains on a rough road. So I, you know, also took a break, sat in the shade, and the family invited me. You can see the bread on the, on the ground, and they offered me this bread. And uh, so I had, uh, by that time, because I had cycled uh, Iran, and then, you know, I was in Tajikistan. So they speak Tajik language, which is very close to Persian language. So by that time, I had started picking up, you know, words and some sentences. So I could understand few words. Um, so the lady asked me if um, I was married. I said, no, I'm not married. And, uh, and then said... Was it know, in English or was it... No, no, it was in Tajik language. So. Okay. Um, so, but as I said, that I was able to pick up few few things. Right. I was, and I'm, I, when I'm, I'm traveling, then I try to learn the lo local languages as much as I can, uh, using the apps or using dictionaries or whatever I can find. And uh, she said that you know, would you like to uh, marry my niece? I said, I said what? And then <laughs> I looked at the niece who is in the in the background, and. Uh, and I looked at it in disbelief because it was unusual proposal in an, in, in an even more unusual circumstances. And I looked at her and she also, you know, uh, nodded. <laughs> and I said, I, you know, I can't be rude. And I said, yes, yeah, why not? I will, I'll marry her. And now suddenly, you know, uh, a film runs in my head that what if I do get married here, you know, it's a beautiful landscape, you know, there are cows here, there are sheep here, and my kids would be running around here. And if I do, uh, you know, marry, then whom am I going to invite to, 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 to this marriage? What would be my friend? What would I tell my family? And then I talked talk to that lady that, you know, I'm a musafir, I'm a traveler, and you see my... Docharkha, Docharkha is bicycle. Um, she said, no problem, I have a horse. <laughs> and uh, you ride the bicycle and I ride the horse next to you. <laughs> I said, that's not a bad idea. And, uh, and while I'm making the list of friends and she asked me, um, do you pray? I said that, yeah, once in a while. <laughs> uh, but no, do you pray five times? Said, uh, big, I said, why? Because he said, I pray five times, I even pray tahajjud. I said, well, I'm not that much of a regular, uh, you know, person who prays. And I said, no, I'm going to marry someone who prays, uh, like me. Um, so she passed on the opportunity. <laughs> and uh, so basically, it was a no. And, uh, but, you know, before I left, then the lady you know, picked up uh, mulberries and, you know, other right. fruits, gave me a handful of fruits and all I could do was just leave, cycle and, you know, uh, fantasize about uh, what could an alternative, been. what could have yeah. been an alternative life. Right. So this was one occasion. Yeah, this is, again, I'm staying with Turkey because one of the st uh, stories that has fascinated me is about this guy. Mm -hmm. uh, he is a person who was walking from France. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said something to you that had an impact on me, but mm -hmm. it had an impact on you. What was that like? Yeah, so in, uh, in Iran, in Marand, there is a town called Marand. So I was hosted by uh, an Iranian guy, and he was taking me to a hostel. And we see that at one place, uh, you know, a bunch of people are standing with the police, and a loud argument is going on. And uh, my host, I don't understand anything the host said. Let me figure out who is the guy. You know, in the middle there is the one guy standing. And he goes there and, and all of them are arguing, blah, 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 blah. And eventually, you know, that my host, Akbar is his name, he brings theory from France. And we all then keep walking, said, just, just keep walking, just keep walking. And then the people who were arguing with him, they 
start leaving one after another and then we are only three people so we go to he leaves us at the uh, at the mehman pazir as they call it a guest house and uh, and then it's a small room like more looks like a prison house basically just a very small window hard mattresses no tv dark and we are you know talking about our our travels and he asked me come on tell me about your journey i tell him about my journey he asked me how much distance do you do in a day I said you know sometime 100 km sometime 150 200 km and he starts shaking his head no no it's too much it's too much and i ask about his travel and he told me that he's coming from france and i ask him that you know how long did it take you considering that you know it had taken me about 3 months from germany to to iran i thought you know maybe he's coming by you know uh, by plane or by hitchhiking whatever it would be you know faster but he tells me you know it had taken him 3 years and i said that you know are you walking and he said yes i'm walking <laughs> and uh, then he said that kamran you are going too fast slow down he said that you know that it is as if you have blinders on both sides and all the time you just you are just looking straight ahead and you at your odometer on your bicycle computer checking out the distance you are not looking right and left you are not talking to the people and he said when i travel i wave at the people if somebody is having a meal i would just go there and ask them can i buy this meal and they invite me and he said that sometime i do 5 kilometers five time i do 10 kilometers sometime i do 1 kilometer so if you want to have those experiences then you got to slow down you got to spend some time um at those places and talk to the people and basically that gave me a new start um and uh, his words um uh, of wisdom um basically then uh, changed my approach to travel and slow down actually became my mantra right and you know i kept slowing But down i think this advice is for down. everyone because we are also looking at our phones a lot we are still blinded by it we are still not enjoying our family and the travels that we do we don't basically stop mm-hmm. as well this is i think not only for you mm-hmm. this advice is applies to everyone but now i want to touch upon your uh, travels to s- all of the americas mm-hmm. basically uh, the one thing that caught my eye was you sleeping in a toilet mm-hmm. how did that come about what well, what's happening over here uh, i mean when you're on a bicycle uh, I mean sometimes the distances between towns or the sleeping places can be huge you know there is it's not that you know every 50 70 or 100 km you would you would have a town right so naturally you don't get to sleep in hotels or you don't always have a bed so there will be some time places where you will have to camp and then you know not all camping places are the same so it's not the ideal condition that you know you will have beautiful sunny afternoon and in the evening light you will have a perfect grass hell you pitching the tent and then the sky will be full starry sky clear sky and you will have beautiful moonlight and then next morning the sun will be shining and you will make breakfast you will just relax in the sun and then take the energy and go on because you don't get you know the uh, the ideal places so in this case what happened was that uh, the day before i had suffered a lot in the tent it was pouring it was you know uh, some hard rain you know falling and my tent was shaking i was afraid the tent poles will break and the ground was so wet the wet the water started seeping into the tent and the mattress was wet the sleeping bag was wet and it was cold and i suffered a lot Oof. and the next day the weather looked exactly the same in alaska i said the tent is already wet the sleeping bag is already wet and the landscape hasn't changed much and the weather looks even worse so what i'm going to do whether i'm going to spend the day the another night in the inside the tent or if i what if i find a roof and guess what i found a roof <laughs> but it was a toilet and uh, and there is some not a lot of traffic but vehicles do pass sometimes and people need to use toilet <laughs> and a person is sleeping inside 
<laughs> so I leave it up to your imagination that sometime I had my tent here and uh, I had to leave the toilet, let somebody use the toilet Oof. and then come back again. And then I'm asleep and somebody needs to use it again. And especially a handicapped yeah. one, so you have to... And uh, so it was stinky like hell, but after a while when I slept, I had beautiful dreams. And that <laughs> told me, that told me, no matter where you sleep, you know, the dreams remain the same. Right. You know? And uh, on the road, yes, I ran out of the funds right in the beginning of my travel. And uh, I had to take loans. And uh, I had to do odd jobs. I mowed people's lawn for a free, free place to camp. Mm -hmm. I served tables. I worked in a print shop. I made websites. I wrote articles. Uh, I picked up food from trash, um, you know, to, you know, feed myself. Um, and all kinds of doing, uh, you know, hauling wood uh, for a free place. Uh, but when you were doing in, that, did you, did you think about giving up? Giving up, I, I have always, you know, uh, you know, the thought of uh, quitting always comes, no matter what. Mm -hmm. uh, because when your body goes through some sort of pain, you try to find out, uh, your mind tells you what is the way to avoid that pain. If, for example, if uh, you're not on a comfortable bed, your body or your brain will tell, okay, switch to other bed or go to some other place. That will be more comfortable. So this, these right. thoughts always come. But when you start analyzing, okay, if I lose, you know, uh, I, if I abandon this way of life, what is the alternative way? Right. Alternative way is, okay, go back to the job, um, you know, make money, um, and then fantasize about this way of life again. Um, and uh, again, being trapped by the materialistic society, uh, trying to do things uh, which, you know, uh, are somebody else's dream right. um, and sometimes you know doing things that you don't even know that you are such a small part of something big especially working in a bigger company you are such a small piece of that that machine so your previous life is basically scaring you and you're continuing yeah. because of that it is yeah okay. it does yeah i have right. no better idea of uh, of, uh, of living right i want to touch upon this story mm -hmm. encounter with wild animals you made a friend mm -hmm. in a fox. Mm -hmm. What was happening over there again? Okay. Yeah, I mean, when you are uh, away from civilization for some time, then you talk to yourself, you talk to trees, you talk to plants, you talk to beers, and then whoever comes in, in your vicinity, uh, even if it is a fox, then, you know, you find some sort of companionship. The companionship is, uh, you know, an essential component of, of being human right. or of, of any species, I believe. And, you know, bicycle becomes a friend. You talk to your bicycle. Why? Once I was on the road, I found a little, um, a little teddy bear, a very small one. I used to talk to that guy, you know, and... Uh, it's uh, like, uh, yeah. I, it's and like I even, Tom Hanks with the boy. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's <laughs> something like this. And uh, when I was uh, in Yukon in Canada, so where I was uh, camping in the woods uh, for a few days, it was a private property. Somebody let me um, camp there, but they told me that, you know, they do get a visitor. And they did not tell me what visitor. <laughs> and then in the evening, I see that a little fox comes and then he just... But you named you know, him Jackie. Yeah. Why was that? Well, what, because what was uh, that? My, uh, uh, the first dog that we had in ah, Leia, right. uh his name was Jackie. And so you were missing him. So, yeah, and I, you know, I wanted, because when I was talking to, to this fox, and I was just telling, hey, Jackie, come, 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 come. You and know that whenever you call him, he makes his eyes like this. Yeah, so they, they, this time it was just chilling out uh, in, the, <laughs> in, the, in the sun. But uh, it, I never, you know, pet, uh, pet <coughs> Jackie, but it would come very close to me. And then it would just hang out, probably... The, the poor creature was looking for maybe for food, uh, which I had nothing to give. Right. Um, and you are not allowed to give. Uh, but, you know, I found some sort of companionship and it was a lonely fox. And perhaps uh, it found companionship uh, in me as well. Right. And, but uh, now I associated, associate, you know, that area 
uh, with, with Jackie. Right. I want to touch upon this guy, a man with no legs, and he's collecting <laughs> panties from travelers. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on over here? This, this is a bit fascinating. To me. Uh, it's kind of an embarrassing, embarrassing story to tell. <laughs> That's why I want to ask. That's why I wrote uh, a long article about it. Um, so I wouldn't go into details, but you can Google it. Uh, <laughs> just Google story of Coco. Yeah, Coco, story of Coco, C-O-C-O. Um, Come on bike with the reference. Uh, but uh, this guy lived in the middle of nowhere in uh, Baja California desert uh, in Mexico, close to the United States border. He had established, you know, uh, a ranch, you know, uh, there, a couple of rooms and a big place uh, for the camper vehicles. He would sell sodas mm -hmm. and uh, he would let people camp uh, or sleep inside. And... Uh, he was a big collector of uh, panties and bras and and other uh, items and uh, he lived also live life in duality because if you look at it, the bottom you see the picture of uh, uh, Virgin de Guadalupe, the Virgin Mary, and then on the top you see uh, panties. Right. And um, I um, urge you guys to read, you know, because in read, by reading that article, you would get to listen to the finer details. Uh, right. <laughs> Definitely. Some of which I cannot, uh, you know, say in person. Right. Something that I want to end with is basically your... Uh, you reach Arctic and you are again trying to roll your bike mm -hmm. over there. What did it feel like? My journey from... Uh, Argentina to Alaska, it took me about uh, four years uh, from the tip of South America, uh, from the southernmost city in the world, all the way to the northernmost uh, point in Alaska, about four years. And uh, so this particular area, um, they don't allow you to take your bicycles because it's a private area and they have, uh, you know, big oil fields there. So you're not allowed to bicycle there. But uh, I got the permission to go there. I said, bicycle? No, 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 you cannot take the bicycle. I said, why are you afraid? Oh, you'll take the bicycle, you'll ride, you know. Okay. Can I take my bicycle wheel with me? Wheel, okay. Very weird, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> take the bicycle wheel. And uh, on that particular day, there was a warning that there was a polar bear. They had seen the polar bear here. Um, so they wouldn't let people, you know, be outside for a very long time. So we had a guide there and guide said, I said that I want to, you know, take my wheel with me, a wheel uh, with me. And he said, yeah, okay, go. And then I set up the tripod and I, you know, rolled the wheel uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the shore. And I dipped the wheel in the, um, in the ocean to mark that, you know, I have reached the uh, land's end. And it was a, a way of, uh, you know, um, closing the loop, closing the story that uh, the same person who used to roll an old motorcycle tire in the dusty streets of Laya is now, after 40 years or so, rolling a bicycle wheel on the Arctic Ocean at the end of journey. And just imagine, you know, uh, you know, all the the series of events that happened in between, you know, from my childhood all the way to my youth, you know, the middle ages and, uh, you know, studies, work, all the bicycle touring and then coming back to, to my roots, right. uh, coming back to that, you know, wheel, that single wheel that I used to. It represented kind of a closure to me. It... Uh, represented, uh, you know, that as if my life had come full circle. So right. Somebody in the audience has also said that some people are born to inspire others. I feel you're one of those who basically does inspire people to follow their dreams and not think about too much. Um, with that, I do want to ask a lot of stories with mm -hmm. you, but we are way over time and I want to open the floor for people to ask their questions. Yes. So first of all, amazing, amazing session. I was curious to know how does the 
the currency thing happens so you keep currency for each country wherever you travel and the, and the visa stuff like how do you manage that and what was the minimum and maximum temperature you have uh, weather mm. you have traveled and the third question would be you said you talk to people but and you learn stories from them but do you really ask them like specific questions is it like an interview is it like ad hoc uh, are they so open with you that they can share their personal stories with you so when i uh, first started my bicycle tour in 2011 so on a pakistani passport um so i had to apply a visa for bulgaria a visa for romania visa mm. for uh, turkey visa for iran big hassle um and uh, after i had spent enough number of years in in germany passed all the tests so then i uh, became eligible for the the german passport i i got it um but still i have to go through visa you know hurdles when the visa is uh, is required for example then again on my last trip i applied for the visa of uh, iran mm. and then i had to apply for visa of uh, turkmenistan uzbekistan tajikistan and uh, visa of, of china and because i had visited iran i had to apply the visa for the united states and while i was on the road um and uh and i had not enough money to show uh and in south america so it was a big uh, hurdle uh on the way because they asked for so many documents uh i spent about 3 weeks in quito in the capital of ecuador uh just working on the application um and uh, luckily i got it uh but i was given one year to reach the states and i reached one day before my visa expired wow. otherwise i would have spent more days along the way right and uh um and yeah so where the visa is applicable uh you there is no other way around mm-hmm. and after a while but uh and then i when the visa ex- of united states expired I, i went again so the same series of question but the moment they when the lady opened the passport and uh to find a place for the empty so uh empty page so you kept flicking um uh, flipping the pages and there were so many stamps so after you have collected enough number of stamps in your passport it becomes easier definitely mm-hmm. currency yes you have to plan accordingly and uh in south america uh, so the, the the countries had different uh, uh um currencies sometimes you are able to you know use us dollars there and uh, other times you know you uh, either change before or right at the border usually you find people at the border they give you bad rate but uh, you know uh, it's not so bad you bargain with them that was the first thing uh, first question what was the second the uh, <coughs> asking people about their stories yeah when uh, you are on a bicycle so you are not a threat to anyone if you are as supposed to if you are on a car on a vehicle <laughs> so the people might s- see that you know you may have some motive mm. you are maybe a journalist you maybe you are a you know a tv guy or someone uh, sent from the government or you know from an ngo or stuff on a bicycle you are sweating you are tired you look like a poor person and they see that you know they see you from miles from this the guys coming slowly <laughs> oh come on you know we are waiting for you we want to see who this stupid guy is <coughs> and eventually you reach there and you are so tired and so you are not a you know threat to to them um and they some sympathize with mm. you they uh you know you gain your sympathies immediately that you mm. know this poor guy and then you are welcomed and that basically gives you a a, a first uh you know helps you establishing the first connection mm. and then it is your own personality your uh curiosity your uh genuine genuine personality genuine curiosity about knowing people that basically uh drives your action whatever you do in life that is basically driven by your uh innate uh you know 
uh, desire to explore the world, the way everybody has their own different way. Mm. And uh, when you are so curious about people, you want to really learn about them, you also basically it means you are respecting them because you are interested in, in what they are doing. You don't see it in a suspicious way. You don't act that way. So every action then, you know, emerges from, from there. And uh, with that approach, basically it is very easy to gain trust of people. But sometimes some societies are closed. Uh, some people don't cooperate. They don't want you to, to, to be there. Some people don't want you to photograph them mm -hmm. because of whatever their tradition, custom or religious beliefs and then you respect them. But most of the time, uh, people welcome you if you uh, show uh, uh, respect and uh, be friendly with them. Mm. It's not a problem. Perfect. So thank you. Uh, I have a question that I saw that you passed the death road in Bolivia. So anything particular you would like to share about that? Um, the death road in Bolivia starts at 4,600 meters about elevation and in a, in a very altiplano environment like everything is covered with snow um, very dry and then as you go down the old death road uh, which was used previously by vehicles and because there is not enough space available on the road sometimes the vehicles when they were overtaking they would you know fall down into abyss and uh, from the edge sometime, you know, it can be 500 to 600 meters of free fall into the deep river. You cannot even see because of the thick forest. But for cyclists, it is not so dangerous because uh, nowadays there is very little traffic on the road. And uh, I mean, cyclists don't need that much of space. Two to three meters is, is, is good enough as long as you have working brakes. And if you, <laughs> your brakes don't, and sometimes you get carried away because, you know, um, because of the, the slopes, you want to go faster, you're looking right and left, and boom, then there's a sharp corner, and the brakes don't apply, and then it is goodbye, Tata. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so just one more thing. Uh, how do you navigate yourself around on such longer tours, like, so how do you manage with, that? Uh, with a lot of planning, um, when, for example, uh, let's say I want to go from here to, uh, I don't know, to, to Paris, for example. So there's one way that I can plan the entire route, uh, but yeah, I mean, let's say Paris is too close. Uh, let's say from here to, to Pakistan. So first I will see on the map, okay, uh, what could be the tentative route. And let's say from here I want to first go to, I don't know, Italy, maybe, yeah. Uh, I want to go a particular spot because it's interesting, even though it's not in the way. Let's say I want to go to Pisa. Um, so I'll not make a route from, from here to Pisa and then all the way to Pakistan. I'll just make a route for next few days of Pisa and then we'll connect the dots. Um, so when I'm like, it really depends on where I'm getting the next hotel or the Wi-Fi connection. So if the Wi-Fi connection is, let's say, after seven days, uh, the hotel, uh, then I will get the, you know, seven day. I will plan for the seven days. If it is, let's say, next town, you know, from here to Nuremberg. So I'll just plan from Munich to Nuremberg. And the next planning, Nuremberg afterwards. Uh, so in small sections, because otherwise you get too overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. You can't process it. You can't remember it. You have to take it in, in chunks. And I really appreciate uh, what you do and uh, what you did for the community as, as a Pakistani. This is also a huge impact, uh, for example, in all over the world. And also, I really appreciate the photography, like, uh, because I'm a visual learner and I really like photography as well. And I see the progression, what you had from Germany till Pakistan and now at the, when you finish your trip in the Americas, it was absolutely brilliant. Uh, my question is like you were traveling, uh, you were traveling mostly with yourself. You had a goal, you started your goal, you finished your goal. But in between, like when Iqbal says, Khudi Kokar Bulan Nitna, did you find your Khudi, your next objective, or your, your inner self? Did you find it your, inside you or something? Could you comment on that? 
I, I see it in this way that, you know, that uh, in all stages of your life, you are going through some, some states, yeah? And each state is temporary. So even if one day, if I f feel like that I have found something, found a nugget in my life, I have found, let's say, eternal peace, which is close to impossible, then the next day there will be some sort of emptiness, there will be some sort of challenges, there will be some worries, and then I will be not as peaceful as I was the day before. But yes, there, has been, there have been moments when I found deeply connected with the universe, when I felt at peace, and when the universe showed me glimpses, uh, you know, of something that were beyond my imagination, beyond what I could even perceive, and that gave me a sense of that I'm part of something bigger, and that something bigger is watching over me, what people sometimes also call as out-of-body experience. Yes, I have passed through those um, uh, stages or states, I have experienced that, and uh, they become kind of a fuel, uh, you know, they become the driving force to keep going. And uh, by uh, doing photography, by writing these stories, by, uh, you know, sharing my experiences, lessons, uh, what I experience on the road, these sort of things give me some meaningfulness um, that, you know, um, that I'm bringing some sort of value uh, to the world that people are also able to travel and learn a little bit the way I learned. Thank you. Finally, thank you, Kamran Bhai, for coming over here. Thank you, Asha Bhai, first of all. Uh, Th th thanks to you, first of all, uh, you did so much research on it. I think you can write a PhD thesis, <laughs> you know, about my travels. And sometimes, you know, I was like, wow, I, you know, this guy even remembers the name of the fox. Uh, you know, because, because, you know, sometimes when you share stories, not many people read these days and it's not their fault. We are so much occupied, you know, with, with so many things. There's so much noise. So thank you so much for uh, taking the time to read those stories of, to, you know, arrange this session, um, you know, structure it, you know, asking meaningful questions, which also made me think. And thanks to the brother who is filming this Imran. and Imran. Imran Bhai and for everyone to you as well. I don't know your name, um, but God bless you. And to every one of you here, you know, for coming to, you know, to listen to my story. And uh, so, yeah, so, I mean, this uh, sharing these experiences is also meaningful to me because it helps me reflect on my own experiences. And when I reflect, then also basically the experience gets distilled and, you know, I draw also some conclusion. So thank you everyone here. Thank you. Thank you.